Welcome. These are two ivory Netsky figures. I served in the Air Force in Japan during the Vietnamese War and collected these and other oriental objects, the art, during that time. They simulate the hard bony orbit and what can happen in Graves' disease in humans. There are increased polysaccharides and glycoproteins in the orbit with increased water binding capacities and oral edema and resultant exophthalmus and other findings. One might call this ivory exophthalmus. The title of my lecture today is a superior and inferior orbital rim based exophthalmometer or orbitometer. And I say orbitometer for an instrument that measures not only exophthalmus and inophthalmus, but hyperophthalmus and hypoophthalmus. In 1983, we presented to the ASOPERS group a superior and inferior orbital rim based exophthalmometer and a modified two wall decompression for moderate exophthalmus. In this, we combined removal of the boot bone laterally with removal of the orbital floor lateral to the infraorbital nerve. All this to leave some orbital bony rim intact and decrease the chances of postoperative diplopia. This is an operative view showing that the lateral orbital rim had been removed as well as the lateral floor. And slide right shows the patient actually on the table and you can see an immediate result and retrogression of the globe with the procedure having been performed on the right. And this is this same lady preoperatively on the left with exophthalmus, moderate exophthalmus and eyelid retraction. Postoperatively, we see this same lady on the right after a decompression and after eyelid retraction with spacer grafts of the auricular muscle complex graft. Long and Ellis in 1986 performed a temporal decompression for Graves' disease, and they graded their results from zero to four in the conventional manner. Obviously, this gradation would appear imprecise. In 1905, Herbal Hertel developed an exothermometer based on the lateral over rim, as you see here and here. But there are problems with the Hertel instrument. Problem number one, if the lateral over rim is altered in any way, this can equal inaccuracy in subsequent readings, even if you replace the lateral over rim, as you see here. But look at the difference here, at least two, to maybe three millimeters there, and lesser amount here. So it's, it, it's not going to be accurate if you use the Hertel instrument in this situation. Cooper and Truckell in 1979 performed a three wall decompression, removed the lateral over rim the medial floor and the medial wall. And they claim nine millimeters of decompression, but since they did remove the lateral over rim, we questioned the ac accuracy of the measurement. Alan Wonk in 1991 advanced the lateral over rim to enhance the decompression using the noggle exothermometer for accuracy, as you see in this slide here. In the lateral orbitotomy for orbital tumor removal, the lateral over rim is removed and so, again, we have inaccurate measurements with the Hertel instrument. Hertel problem number two, discomfort with the medial flange can equal patient movement in accuracy as well, or even no reading at all, because the flange pressing in this congested area, which is seen quite frequently in Graves patients, it hurts, there's movement in that and inaccuracy. These are two Graves patients also showing some minimal congestion in the lateral canthal area. Sometimes this is, uh, the congestion is enormous. Uh, this is more congestion and pain is imparted in this area with the Hertel instrument or would be, but we use the Noggle instrument and with pressure here, 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 and here. So it's virtually no pain. This is, a patient with conjunctival inflammatory disease, congestion in the lateral canthal area, and this child typifies the, the uh, situation where it's very difficult to obtain uh, exophthalmometry in a child. In this child, we bribed him to let us take a, a, an exophthalmometry reading with our instrument, and you can see he's happy as a clam, and the pressure again is here and here and here, and he 
did not complain of any kind of pain. Her tail problem number three, there's a disparity in the serial base readings. And so here we are with the her tail instrument in place in front of the skull. But in the serial reading, the flange can be either inferior, superior, lateral, or medial. So it's not going to be exactly where you put it in the first reading. In our situation with the Noggle instrument, we have these black areas in the mid pupil and the medial wall of the vertical strut placed exactly in the mid pupil. So it's going to be in the same spot in serial measurements as it was in the original. Her tail problem number four is the inability to measure hyperophthalmus and hypoophthalmus, traumatic left hypoophthalmus, as this as is the case in this lady. Now, the advantages of the device is that there's increased accuracy post decompression, post lateral orbitotomy for Graves' disease. There's increased accuracy post lateral orbitotomy for oral tumor removed because you have to remove the lateral rim to uh, remove the tumor. Number three, there's increased comfort with plastic vertical fixation bars over the superior and inferior orbital rim with decreased patient movement and increased accuracy. This little guy is obviously happy as a clam himself. Number four, the ability to align the instrument horizontally as well as vertically equals increased accuracy in serial readings, because here we're putting the, the black area and the medial wall of the vertical strut in the middle and the mid pupil. And this shows the red vernier placed in the little notch at 22 millimeters in this particular instrument, uh, all in an effort to decrease parallax. So number five advantage, the ability to measure hyperphthalmus and hypoophthalmus as you see another patient with traumatic left hypoophthalmus. These are two earlier prototypes, another prototype on the left and the current instrument on the right. So the, th so the salient features are of our instrument is that they're plastic vertical fixation bars over the superior and inferior orbital rim. There's a mirror prism system similar to the Hertel instrument, and there's a red vernier system to decrease parallax. The dark areas and medial portion of the vertical fixation bar aligned in the mid pupil again for horizontal and vertical alignment. And then there's, then there's a vertical gradient scale for measurement for hyperphthalmus and for hypophthalmus. Number six, the spirit level we've utilized to try to ensure the instrument remains level during readings, especially for the vertical globe, uh, globe displacement, we're still working on refining this. This is basically like a carpenter's level. You see with the bubble in the middle. There was an article in Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery in 1997 entitled Exophthalmometry, a Comparative Study of the Noggle and Hertel Instruments by Harvey Cole, John Cuvion, Alan Fink, Barrett Hike and Peter Castle, MD, PhD, who did our biostatistics. In the first part of the study, they found the Hertel instruments to be more variable in terms of coefficients of variation. They found further the Hertel based instruments to vary more between observers than those of the Noggle instrument. The results of this analysis strongly suggest that the values obtained from the Noggle exothermometer are more repeatable in serial measurements as compared with the Hertel values. Single measurements of globe position from all patients were statistically so similar, so ostensibly we can use the same readings as the Hertel. It's uh, our Netsky friend again showing Netsky ivory exophthalmus. I actually saw a couple of these while I was over here, over in Japan. And exophthalmus is everywhere, as you can see. And this is just a, a refund check for one penny from the United Health Insurance Company. And no comment, no further comment on this. And I certainly appreciate your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.